Hey friends, welcome back to No More Silos. My name is Erica Santiago and I am excited that you have decided to join me once again. Um, This is a podcast about cultural Christianity and so it's part Bible study, part me ranting or rambling and part, uh, well I hope it's fun and I hope that you've been enjoying it. So thank you to all of my listeners, all of my regular listeners. Uh, Please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. That will ensure sure that you don't miss an episode if I fail at updating my social media, which by the way, on Instagram and Facebook is cultural Christianity. So follow me at cultural Christianity on Instagram or on Facebook uh, to make sure that you're in the know with what I'm thinking about this week. One of the things I'm hoping to work on a little bit this summer is to uh, start doing a few lives uh, or just uploading short videos just to kind of give you guys a uh, little tidbits in between episodes or, or resources. Today, I'm, uh, this is episode uh, season two, episode five, and today we are talking about relationships. In the last few weeks, what we've been really focused on is discipleship and how uh, culture, how cultural Christianity, is impacting the way we do discipleship in the body of Christ, in the church. And one of the things that I have seen uh, over the years is that we have. Uh, We do a great job in the church of assimilation programs, getting people who are new believers started and going with where to go or acclimating them to our particular local church. Uh, If you were already a believer and just changing your location of where you worship. But what we realized is that we also are not, we're letting relationships happen organically. And, And yes, that happens. But when we think about how small groups are supposed to function and how church communities grow, that's not really what we see exactly in the New Testament, how we saw the early church grow. And one thing we know about the early church is that it was irresistible. People were excited to worship together. They were excited to grow spiritually. They were excited to hear about the gospel, to hear about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from people who were genuine eyewitnesses to that fact. And so what we see a lot in the New Testament in Paul's letters or Peter's letters or John's letters or Jude or James is where they're doing a lot of course correcting. It's like, okay, we went down this path. Hold on. Let's reel it back in. Let's fix that. And the way that we do that, the way that we do course correcting is through our relationship. It's the relationships with people. It's the people in our lives that really, that we connect with that help us do these course corrections. And, but when we do it with a gospel filter, when we do it with Jesus, it is a whole different experience. And that's what we're talking about today on No More Silos. So I'm glad that you're here. Let's get started. So I, I, like I said, I'm grateful for the relationships that I have in my life. But I'm also grateful for the experiences along the journey to seeing my relationships through the filter of the gospel. This is how the early church navigated their new life in Christ. We see this evident, uh, evidenced in Paul's letters and other letters, how he starts them and how he ends them. And so, for example, uh, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he starts off in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ. Christ Jesus, our Lord. And and he's talking, uh, he talks to Timothy. Paul is talking to Timothy as a son, as a spiritual son. That's their relationship. And we'll talk about how to define relationships in just a few moments. Um, One of the things that Paul does, though, in this letter to Timothy is he goes on in verse three, he starts, he's talking about this course correction that I mentioned just a moment ago. Verse three says, as I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You see that, that course correction? He's like, hey, Timothy, my son in the ministry, uh, as your, your father, spiritual father, pastor, 
that's the role that that Paul is taking on here in this relationship. We see it again in um, in Philippians and um, Titus, how Paul references uh, talks to Titus as being his son. But then another course correction example is Jude. Jude was Jesus's one of Jesus's brothers, as was James, and it starts off. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Like he's saying, I I'm not even going to own up to the fact that I'm Jesus's half biological brother. I am going to focus on I am a brother of James and everybody knew James was also Jesus's brother. I am writing to all who have been called by God, the father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. And then this is where Jude really goes in with the course correction. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. That That's how Jews starts off. He's like, hey, I was going to write you just a letter and a few words of encouragement, but it appears that we need to have a deeper conversation about apologetics. In Philippians, Paul writes uh, in uh, Philippians 1, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church's leaders and deacons. May God, the, may God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And then he says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And he goes on to to talk about that joy and and thanksgiving for for his friends and his partners in the ministry. And we see that even in the way that the New Testament letters to the churches end. Usually the last chapter or so is just a who's who of shout outs and saying hello. We see that in Paul's letter to the church at Rome, where he shouts out Phoebe, who carried the letter, uh, where he shouts out uh, others who work with him in the ministry there that he knows. And he's like, hey, I have a personal relationship with these people because of how we have worked together. And so Anyway, while I'm always looking for ways to connect the dots with church history and church now, and I really believe that, and this is really our objective here at No More Silos, it's how that informs how we disciple others, like what we understand about the context that scripture is written in, uh, how we understand the context of of church history and how the in, the early church interpreted these letters and what they did with them and how they took uh, that information. I think I, I mentioned this last season that I wanted to do an episode about how the canon was formed. Um and I, I might do that because I think that I, I still might do that because it is important to understand that these letters weren't just arbitrarily picked. Uh, they were selected by people in the church because of the fact that they outline course correction, they outline theology, they outline right belief and right doctrine. And they also outline, as we see in, in Titus, in Paul's letter to Titus, Christian living in a teaching community making sure that you know what the leaders' uh, characteristics the leaders should have versus what they shouldn't have. That's really how we're connecting the dots. But the other thing that I want to talk to talk with us, uh, talk with you all about today is I think that because we, we really want to be seen by other people, in turn, we must also be able to see them. And part of our, our gospel filter allows us to do that. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the dignity that begins begins in creation. Relationships, our model for relationships also begins there. Our model for relationships begins in Genesis with uh, God creating us in his image, how Adam and Eve first interacted with one another, and how uh, God communicates with people both before and after the fall. 
But one of the things that uh, that Jesus comes to reconcile, not only our relationship with God, but also our relationship with, with one another. And you've heard me talk about it in the context of the horizontal and the vertical. The vertical relationship is with God and the horizontal relationship is with each other. And we see that throughout the Gospels in the New Testament, how important it is that we are in right relationship with other believers. So relationships begin in Genesis. God made humans. He gave us dominion over the earth and he had Adam, which in Hebrew simply means man. And he names all the animals and he sees them and he names them. And uh, oh, side note, by the way, animals are not food yet. They're just, they're, they're there. Uh, <laughs> that comes later with Noah. Uh, minor detail. Anyway, Adam is a vegetarian, but all the animals are paired up, or as some folks might say, booed up. And Adam is lacking companionship. So God pulls woman out of his side. Uh, he sees her, Adam sees her, and he names her, and they have a naked and unashamed intimate relationship with each other and with God until the fall when sin enters and screws everything up. And so Jesus coming back, and we see that in the early part in the first chapter of Ephesians, when Jesus comes back, Jesus comes to reconcile us, not only with God, but with one another. Um, But look at the imagery in Genesis of what that intimacy looks like in relationship. I want you to, to really meditate on that. So what does relationship have to do with cultural Christianity? Well, we've been trying to fix our relationships without Jesus since the fall. I mean, there's there's shelves upon shelves in bookstores. There's pages upon pages online on uh, Amazon of books that focus on how to fix our relationships. And even though for the last 2,000 years we have Jesus who reconciled us to right relationship with God, we are still struggling to get right relationship with one another. Jesus commands, love God, love one another, love others. They will know you're my disciples by how you love. What does love require of me? Uh, And the cross is that symbol, that vertical love God and that horizontal love people. But cultural Christianity allows us to think that we are following Jesus, but without addressing our relationships with God or with others. Uh, Church is something we go to or something we do on Sunday, and the rest of our week is our individualized efforts at doing things on our own, or only with people we like. Or worse, for some people we don't like, trying to impress people we don't like to get them to like us or see us. I think one of the reasons of the pandemic, or one of the lessons, sorry, one of the lessons of the pandemic has been about how we see others in our society. Things like wearing a face mask or not wearing a face mask. My body, my right. Instead of how does this help my fellow humans stay safe from a deadly pandemic? While at the same time, people want to blow up abortion clinics and pass laws that remove the right to make choices about women's bodies because they shouldn't have the right to make their own health choices or taking away voting rights because the other people might not vote the way you want them to. That's the picture that some Christians are painting today. And that tells me that they've never had a loved one die or get sick last year from COVID. No empathy. That tells me that they never had a friend with an unexpected pregnancy have to make the impossible choice. No empathy. That tells me that they would rather have things support their privilege at the expense of others' ability to thrive. No empathy. No love. So by the standard that Jesus himself set, that you will know my disciples by how they love, well, I'll let you finish that thought. Are we doing a great job as as Christians modeling or witnessing what it means to be a follower of Christ in the world? So this week, the books that I, uh, I'm looking at to tear down the silos around relationships so that we can better disciple others, uh, so we can be more effective, uh, we're still looking at Irresistible by Andy Stanley, Relational Intelligence by Darius Daniels, and Emotionally Healthy Discipleship by Pete Scazzaro. And in relational intelligence, uh, what we're going to focus on, it's really the book that we're going to focus on and draw from today. Uh, Dr. Darius Daniels points out or outlines for us four levels of relationship, four types of or characteristics of relationship. But the things that I want to want you to observe in the other two books that we're reading this season, uh, in Emotionally healthy discipleship, uh, Pete talks about be before you do, being with God before you're doing for God. He also talks about, has a chapter called Make Love the Measure of Maturity. And I, I think that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that really, you know, 
well, let me put it this way. Usually when we read 1 Corinthians, we are focused on uh, like it's a poem at someone's met wedding. But let me pause for a second here and read it for you from the message translation and think about it in the context of making love the measure of your maturity, because this impacts our relationships. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from the Message Translation, which is a, a, a paraphrased uh, American English vernacular uh, uh, version. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like an, any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of the three is love. That was the message translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, what's interesting about that, if we're going to learn how to engage in transforming discipleship best practices, we have to learn how to build healthy relationships that understand the perspectives of others. We have to be able to walk in their shoes, empathize with their lived experiences, and value their inherent dignity as made in the image of God. And how we interpret the Bible and how we determine if a passage is based on culture or in creation informs how we see the world around us. It informs how we live. It informs how we love. But culture tells us we can do it alone. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps or on the other end of that spectrum, be codependent or settle for unhealthy relationships. And so the book that we're taking a let. I'm encouraging you to read and read all of it um, by Darius Daniels. Relational intelligence considers Jesus's relational model for choosing the twelve disciples. Uh, Dr. Darius walks you through how to assess your relationships, define them, discern them, align them, and finally activate your relationships to unlock your greatest potential. Healthy relationships help us to navigate discipleship better. Isn't that what we're talking about in this season? Uh, Emotionally healthy discipleship, pointing people to the irresistible love of Jesus, the irresistible uh, new humanity, that that Christian living, the way that it's described and actually described in scripture when we read it in context. So what are these categories in which people should define their relationships? Well, according to Dr. Daniels, there are four categories in which people should define their relationships, and that is friends, associates, assignments, and advisors. 
friends, associates, assignments, and advisors. This is not a book on your relationship with your spouse. This is not a book on your relationship on, on marriage or finding the husband. This is about becoming you. Here are the definitions according to relational intelligence, according to the book. Friends, number one would be people where there's a mutual interest in being present for one another, for each other, supporting one another, and doing life with each other. I'll read that one more time. People where there's a mutual interest in being present for each other, supporting one another, and doing life with each other. That's a friend. But here's an associate. An associate is someone you've developed a relationship with, but the relationship is merely the consequence of intersecting schedules where we work together, we go to school together, we attend the same gym, and as a result, we have a relationship. But the kind of reciprocity, the kind of reciprocity that's present in a friendship may not be present with an associate. Now, let me pause right there because that's the one that most of us get stuck on. We have these expectations of people that we are merely living life through intersecting schedules. They're at the gym at the same time. They go to church at the same time. They go to the service at the same time. Our kids go to school together. And we have these expectations that we place on them for friendship. And then our feelings are hurt when it doesn't happen. And so in the book, Relational Intelligence, you are given resources and biblical principles on how to navigate all of that. But I want to share with you an example from my world of teaching project management. When I teach project management for e-discovery in the litigation technology world, one of the things that I always talk about, one of the part of the lesson is always about managing expectations. If you've ever had to manage a project, you know that there are stakeholders in the project, people who are invested either financially in your project or they're invested because they're also working on the project. They're part of your team. But then there's someone who's in charge of the project and they are like the project sponsor. They are part of the team, but they may not actually be doing any of the work. They're just invested in it. But everybody has a set of expectations. And here's the kicker. Sometimes those expectations are stated, and a lot of times those expectations are unstated. We see this a lot in the in, in how we navigate our friends versus our associates, because we put these unstated friendship expectations on our associates that we shouldn't be putting there. And that creates problems for us. Um, It gets our feelings hurt. And then we think that this person is not being a good friend when really they were never your friend in in the first place. Y'all just were showing up in the same place at the same time and you remembered each other's names. The next two categories are assignment and advisor. An assignment is quite simply a mentee, an advisee, someone you feel called to help coach or mentor. An advisor is an individual that is mentoring, advising, or coaching you. Last year, we spent a few weeks in our weekly Bible study at Mosaic sharing and walking through the principles outlined in this book. So I definitely recommend getting a copy to read or to listen to because it will totally change how you see and interact with the people in your life. The thing that really uh, that I find interesting is looking at Jesus's parables. So I know we read so far from Genesis and we read today from uh, 1 Corinthians. Now I want to share with you Jesus's parable about pruning the fruitless Christians out of your life. And it's interesting because on a relationship standpoint, from a relationship standpoint, it makes so much sense. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how Jesus talks in parables, I definitely recommend, I'll put it in the show notes, Bible Project video on parables because I think it's in there how to read the Bible series. And I'll put that in the show notes because a parable is just a, is a story, a way of the way the ancient world spoke in stories. They gave an example. And so Jesus speaks a lot of times in the gospels in parables and uh, chapter 15 of John's gospel begins with, uh, with a parable about the true vine. And as I read, you'll kind of, I hope that you will see how this gives us a, this gives us a filter for our relationships, our friends, our associates, our advisors, and our assignments. 
Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. So Jesus is talking to his audience in John's gospel as it's been recorded here. And he gives us this parable about the vine. And we often skip over the pruning part. And what even really was surprising to me was how much we skip over a lot of uh, how this flows in context. Because Jesus goes from, hey, pruning yourself and your friends and making sure that you're, you know, in a fruitful relationship with me. Um, But he's still talking to the same audience a few verses later when he says, obey his commandments. And no greater love uh, is, is, is exists than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Isn't that what he did on the cross? He laid down his life for us. And then he tells us, uh, gives us this command to love one another. So how do we do this in making disciples or living Christian lives? We do it together. We see, we see in Paul's letter to Titus that uh, clearly, that this is clearly a community that had a vine planted by Paul, Paul being the church planter that planted uh, the church in Crete. That's, uh, that's where he assigns Titus uh, to go and pastor. And, but now Paul is sending Titus to do some pruning. The vine was planted by Paul. Things were going good, but just like we saw earlier in the beginning of some of the letters, there's there's course correction that has to happen. Pruning has to happen. So Titus's job is to go and do some pruning and point people back to Jesus. So no more silos comes into play here because not only are we seeing what is it that we're trying to point people to in 1 Corinthians, what is it that we're being reconciled to in Genesis 2, silos are created when we don't read the whole parable in context. A lot of times I've only, I've heard the, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, and it's like a meme. It's not even tied to the whole fruitfulness of our relationships with Christ or relationships with one another. Uh, So seeing that whole Uh, John 15 parable in context. And then when we miss the fact that Jesus reconciled us to God, like in Genesis 2, so that we can have that level of intimacy that Adam has with Eve, but we have to be emotionally and spiritually mature, like we see in 1 Corinthians 13. That same love is described there by Paul so that we can successfully define our relationships, define who our friends are versus our associates, define our advisors or identify our advisors versus our assignments. And that is so important to be able to point people back to Jesus, to be able to uh, live in Christian community, to be able to have no more silos around what we uh, believe to be Christianity so that we 
can tell the difference between culture and what's actually in the Bible. And that is how relationships and working on our relationships, uh, doing relationships better, helps us with disciple making. Because a lot of times disciple making may be where you are an advisor for someone. Someone is your assignment to disciple. Someone is your associate. There may be you know two ships passing in the night, so to speak. But that person that's your associate, they may be simply there for a season to drop something into you spiritually or you them and being okay with that and understanding that season. That's what I've got for today. I'm glad that you joined me on No More Silos. My name's Erica, and follow me on social media at Cultural Christianity. Also, really important, subscribe to the podcast if it's on Apple if you get, or Google Play, wherever you are listening to podcasts, if it's Amazon, Spotify, please subscribe so that you don't miss an episode, so that it's definitely, definitely there. And so check the show notes for links to anything I may have mentioned, and I'll put the scripture there too so that you can uh, find that information as well. Hey friends, thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Erica. Follow me on Instagram or Facebook at Cultural Christianity. Shoot me an email if you've got show ideas or topic ideas at podcast at ericasantiago.com. I really enjoy hearing from you and I really thank you for joining me on this journey as we've been talking today specifically about relationships and discipleship. Have a great day.